<clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. So we'll give you a few minutes to uh, come into the program. Uh, this is part of a series of conversations that started back in May, uh, actually in March, when COVID-19 uh, became a reality. We tried to get a way for us to continue to communicate, to engage, to uh, provide a context uh, to the world that we are uh, both experiencing and living. Uh, I'm Dr. Hatem Bazian, the director of the Islamophobia Studies Center. And uh, it's really a pleasure, uh, and I'm really delighted uh, to have with me uh, Dr. Mitri, Mitri Rahib. Uh, last time we visited each other, or you visited us, was here right uh, in Berkeley at the Pacific School of Religion when we had the 10th anniversary of the Kairos document, and we had a conversation to really discuss the ins and outs of what has taken place in Palestine. Uh, Dr. Mitri is the founder and president of Dar al Kalima University College of Arts and Culture in Bethlehem, uh, in Palestine. And uh, to his credit, is the most widely published Palestinian theologian to date, uh, with 16 books uh, to his credit. And I did put on the chat uh, the, bio, uh, the bio as well as the link to his webpage. Uh, it's very important for me as an academic, as a person that works and deals with Palestine, that the voices of Palestinians are centered. Uh, we are often spoken about, but not spoken to, one, and not allowed actually to speak in our own voice. Uh, my often description is that we are in a theater piece about our own lives, and we're supporting actors in our own lives, that our role is to come in, bring the tea, and exit, and then everybody continues the conversation about us uh, in general. So uh, this is part of the conversation that really to center uh, Palestinian voices in the uh, really the breadth of contributions. I know in the West, we know the works of Edward Said, uh, Abu Lughod, uh, Lisa Hajjar and others. And this is really a pleasure for me to have Mitri with me. Uh, so welcome Mitri and uh, marhaba, kayf al hal, and welcome to our conversation. Uh, thank you, uh, Hatem. It's really a pleasure to be with you uh, this evening. Yeah. Uh, maybe just uh, just give us a short biography of uh, you know who you are, how you grew up, uh, uh, both in terms of your family background, but also academically and in terms of your training. Yeah, I mean, I was born in Bethlehem um, and grew up here. Uh, I did. Um, my studies, uh, all, all my studies actually in Germany. Uh, and I finished there my doctorate uh, in uh, 1987. Uh, came back to Palestine uh, six months before the first Intifada started. Um, I came back thinking that uh, I'm coming back with all the answers to the questions of my people. And the first Intifada just uh, taught me that, I mean, these uh, Western answers don't fit uh, the questions people in Palestine have. So I really had to learn to listen to our people during the first Intifada because uh, all the clashes at that time, demonstrations were happening around our church and personage. So we were in the middle, downtown Bethlehem, where everything was happening. And actually this uh, helped me to start uh, doing contextual theology. Mm -hmm. So what does really Christian theology mean in the Palestinian context? I mean, when you, when you have every Sunday to climb up uh, the pulpit, I became pastor of, senior pastor of Christmas Lutheran Church. Uh, when you have to climb up the, the pulpit every Sunday to preach and your people are under siege, uh, you know, uh, under oppression, uh, you cannot do it the way the, you know, this ivory tower theology does. Uh, and so that was really the beginning of this uh, journey towards contextual theology, post-colonial theology, decolonial theology. Uh, and uh, from theology, I moved also to action. Action meaning uh, I felt we had to create 
uh, institutions that uh, empower our people. Uh, and, but I didn't choose their theology uh, as the tools for social transformation, but arts and culture. Mm. Uh, because I think arts and culture uh, provide a very important platform for the whole Palestinian people uh, to come together. Uh, you know, when I studied in Germany, every time we were talking about with other Palestinian students about uh, politics, uh, often we were, you know, clashing. Mm -hmm. uh, about religion, people were a bit, you know, shy to talk about religion. But when we started, uh, say, singing uh, Fairuz, everyone was on board. Mm. And this showed me actually how important actually also culture to bring uh, people together, especially uh, as Palestinians, we are so fragmented by Israel. Um, uh, and and uh, we need to fight this fragmentation uh, through many means, political, uh, social, uh, cultural, economic. Uh, and for me, the cultural aspect is important. Well, picking up on your in, uh, first point about contextual theology, and I think your work, if I may say, in terms of contextual theology as well, liberation theology in general, how does that look in the, maybe the specifics of it relative to the Palestinians and to distinguish it possibly from uh, the discussions about theological discourses that we see in here, and we'll pick up on some of the issues relative to Christian Zionism and the particular theology that we see. Right. You know, uh, for me, contextual theology has been a journey, really, uh, uh, along the way. Uh, and I guess the problem in Palestine often was that lots of the Christian theology was imported. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, you know, our best theologians were uh, maybe educated abroad uh, and often they wanted to bring those ideas back to Palestine without contextualizing them. Now that does not work. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, uh, how can we develop a theology from the heart of the Palestinian struggle? This was the question really that I was interested in. And so listening to the people and to their questions is really important and crucial in this process. Uh, so this is one. Secondly, uh, how can we connect uh, while doing theology with, uh, with many streams of theology abroad uh, that are struggling in a similar way like us? Uh, this is why, for example, with uh, Kairos Palestine, Mm -hmm. um, uh, when we wrote the document and we decided to call it Kairos mm -hmm. uh, because we wanted to connect to the struggle in South Africa mm -hmm. uh, against apartheid because people in South Africa wrote the Kairos South Africa document back in 1985 uh, and so we wanted to connect with that. When I look today at what's happening in the United States on the streets uh, you know, George Floyd, uh, 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 Jacob uh, Black, uh, Jacob Black, etc. Exactly. I mean, you know, you can see many uh, similarities. And so connecting with the struggle of the African Americans is really important. C connecting to the struggle with uh, Native Americans uh, in the States, in Australia, in many other countries that experience settler colonialism is important. So, so that's really, I think, what is exciting with contextual theology is how to develop a theology from the heart of Palestinian uh, context. So we have to be rooted, like I always say, like uh, an olive tree. Mm -hmm. You know, our roots deeply rooted in the Palestinian soil, but our branches connect with the whole world especially those who are struggling like us. So that's really uh, how we do, how I do contextual theology. And uh, maybe I would uh, add to the following that both of us work on colonialism, settler colonialism. And you mentioned early that uh, some part of our theology has been imported to us. And so we actually often, we don't pay attention to the educational infrastructure that we all came out of, which basically have oriented us in to see the world in a particular way, even our own theology. And this is not exclusive to uh, the Christian Palestinian community, but similarly, 
uh, Muslim communities, likewise, in terms of their educational infrastructure, emerges of that colonial experience. Exactly, and I think this is uh, this is a very really a very important point. Now, what I discovered on this journey was that uh, it's good for us uh, to reread the Bible because you know the Bible actually is a product that came out of Palestine. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and most of the text of the Bible, actually, if not all of them, were written in context of oppression. Uh, because Palestine, uh, historically, was facing all of these empires. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the first Assyrian Empire, you know, uh, all the way to the Israeli-American uh, Empire today, uh, that's our story. And so actually the Bible, if, if we read it from our own perspective, this is really uh, what the original context was. But then this book, uh, after the fourth century with the Constantinian uh, conversion, it became the book of the empire, mm. uh, rather than the book of those oppressed fighting the empire. So how can we reclaim that original uh, story and history, uh, which is again, that is, I mean, the Bible really was written in the context of Palestine, not in the context of, I mean, uh, I mean, Jesus always, I say, was born in Bethlehem, Palestine, not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And so we have to read it in that context. I do always often mention that we have what you call imperial religion where the text is taking place and is adopted by empire versus uh, the religion and the text of the people where uh, Jesus, Moses, Muhammad were walking with the people uh, rather than seeing being uh, in the court of empire as public relations, religious officers of empire. Exactly, exactly. These are... Uh... يعني أنبياء البلاط من سميهم بالعربي you know yeah. uh, the prophets of the uh, not sure what's in English in German it's hof prophet so the, yeah the prophets of the court exactly yeah so yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe we could right now shift a little bit uh, in relations to what is taking place on Palestine on the ground today uh, I know that the Christian community in the West Bank is uh, really is unable to visit its religious sites in Jerusalem on a, any regular basis, but the restrictions in general that is there. Uh, so how living under occupation and the, under structures uh, that uh, really cuts out the Palestinians from one another from different towns. Uh, I know for a fact that people maybe in Nablus have not been able to visit Bethlehem just because of the difficulty or somebody actually born in the West Bank not actually visiting any of the important sites without even speaking about the 1948 area. Right. I mean, this is actually a part of a settler colonial project, uh, which takes more and more land and confine uh, the indigenous people in uh, something like reservations. So if you look today actually at, at the map of the West Bank uh, and Gaza, it looks very much like a piece of a Swiss cheese where basically Israel gets the cheese and the Palestinians are pushed in the holes. And so leaving the hole become a struggle in itself. So Bethlehem in itself is this kind of a hole within the cheese. So if you want to go to Jerusalem, we need a permit. Mm -hmm. uh, if we want to go to Hebron in the south, you know, we have to go through uh, Israeli settlements, Israeli checkpoints. Uh, if you want to go to Jericho, we have to go to, through uh, Israeli checkpoints. If you want to go to Ramallah, we have to go through checkpoint. So this is the shrinking space uh, mm. that we are experiencing. Um, and, and the idea behind it is to take as much land as possible, uh, either de facto, which is happening all the time, or de jure, which is the idea behind the annexation. Uh, and so we, we feel squeezed more and more and more and more. And, and the aim of this actually is to push Palestinians out 
for them to say life is unbearable, uh, let's look for other opportunities uh, uh, to, to reach and to unleash our full potential. Uh, I mean, if you look at Gaza, and uh, we have started a training center in Gaza a year ago. I mean, Gaza is the largest open air prison in the world. Um, everything is polluted, you know, the sea, the air, the underground water aquifer. And according to international experts, life already in 2020 in Gaza is unlivable. Mm. Uh, and so you make life so easy so that everyone in Gaza think, you know, how can I get out and never come back? And this is part of settler colonialism because the difference between settler colonialism and colonialism as such is that settler colonialism wants to replace mm. the indigenous people uh, and kick them out. Uh, so because in the settler colonial mentality, the settlers are there to stay, but the indigenous people are there to go. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, our people, Christian Muslims, uh, feel all of these restrictions, even if we want to go, you know, on Holy Week to Jerusalem uh, to pray, it is a struggle. Uh, and often, you know, uh, maybe one person is getting a permit from the family, uh, his brother or sister are not getting. And so you create, you know, all of these, uh, you know, all of these measures uh, just to make the life of people uh, miserable. And this is really the, the whole idea behind it. And maybe that touches on uh, some of the issues we confront here in the United States in our work and advocacy for Palestine. Uh, as you know, the narrative that is brought out, uh, sometimes even the Israeli um, uh, ambassador will put an editorial in the uh, Chicago Tribune or Washington Post, saying that we're trying to protect the Palestinian Christian community from their Muslim counterparts. And the reason that the Christian community's numbers in Palestine is declining is because of this tension. Now, uh, I know there is a historical tensions and a relationship between Muslim and Christians. We have a long history in relations, but how that narrative gets constructed in essence to really rally support for Israel. So how do you navigate that particular uh, narrative and i know you recently participated in a conference in qatar uh, that focused or not recently maybe just a while back that looked at the christians of the east and the forced migration that has been underway yeah actually this is uh, an interesting question had them mm -hmm. because my uh, upcoming book uh, which i just finished this week and uh, we just are signing the contract uh, with the publisher uh, it's called The Politics of Persecution. Oh, nice. Uh, and I look at this narrative uh, about Christian persecution. Uh, and it's really very interesting because uh, it, this, this narrative is not about, uh, about the reality, it's about the perception, mm. and it's about a Western perception. Uh, and uh, I, I looked at the, the history of the Middle East in the last 150 years. Uh, and actually, uh, if you look at the Middle East 150 years ago, it was the most pluralistic society. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, over 25% of the population were Christians, mm -hmm. uh, ethnically diverse. But the Muslim uh, community itself is also very diverse. Sure. Uh, and, and this idea of Christian persecution actually started uh, as, as a narrative uh, in the uh, uh, middle of 19th century as a way for Western empires to interfere mm -hmm. uh, in what is happening in the Middle East. And so this became the narrative. And then later, after First World War, the narrative became majorities versus minority. So, mm. because suddenly the empires, British and French, were controlling the Middle East, so they couldn't speak about persecution of Christians, so they started talking about majority minority. We are there to protect the minorities, mm. not only the Christian minorities, Alawites and others, you know, Shiite and so on. 
Uh, and now actually with, with President uh, Trump and Vice President Pence, we saw that this narrative is coming back uh, vehemently. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, you, you hear uh, conferences, large conferences about uh, uh, protecting the per persecuted Christians, defending the, the persecuted Christians. And this is part of actually a Western, very conservative, a populist agenda that utilizes and instrumentalizes uh, the Christians of the Middle East uh, for their own, uh, not for our own sake, but for the sake of the Christian right, basically, and uh, the Christian politicians. Uh, and actually, you know, uh, Mahmoud Darwish uh, wrote a poem uh, uh, the title was uh, They Love Me Dead. Mm. And he was talking actually about some of the Arab countries who always like to see the Palestinians as murderers. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's saying they like me dead so that they can oigilize me. Mm. And what I'm saying is that uh, this Western uh, Christian Zionist uh, movement they like to have the Christians of the Middle East persecuted so that they can oigilize us. Mm. Uh, and, and we, uh, I think what is, what, when you started uh, uh, this evening, you said something very important. Uh, you know, we cannot tolerate anymore anybody to speak on our behalf. Mm -hmm. We have to speak on our own behalf. And we have to develop our own narrative. Uh, uh, and we have to tell our own story as we see it. And the time for Britain or France or the US to have mandate over us because we are not ready uh, to be in control is over. And this is, I think, part of uh, the, uh, what we are trying to do uh, is really um, to to resist this attempt to victimize us, to minoritize us, uh, and to utilize us for their own political ends. Well, the notion that the indigenous, the colonized subject is unable to practice and enter into self-governance, into democracy, into participatory, and therefore they still have to be trained on how to do it. And often, again, the trainer that comes is not interested in your uh, liberation, your taking control of your life, your society, your resources in particular. And maybe that gets us into the whole process of the annexation. And if you uh, comment about the recent United Arab Emirates Israel deal, because it's been posited that uh, this stop Israel annexation. Uh, so what's your uh, view of this current uh, uh, annexation and then the United Arab Emirates Israel deal and how are you viewing it? Yeah, uh, very important question. I mean, the annexation is happening de facto on daily basis. I mean, Israel is confiscating land on daily basis demolishing houses around Jerusalem on a daily basis, uh, uh, building uh, and uh, expanding settlements on a daily basis. So the de facto annexation is going on. Uh, for the time being, the de jure annexation uh, was frozen, um, I don't think for long. Uh, and I think uh, the, the idea uh, you know, behind this, uh, I mean, even call it the Abraham Accord mm -hmm. is disgusting. Uh, because you are trying actually to package uh, something that has, you know, nothing to do with the Bible to package it uh, in a biblical language of Abraham and, you know, the Abrahamic religions and Islam and, and Judaism are coming together, etc. Uh, I guess the idea behind it was, uh, first of all, the timing of it has to do with the problems that 
uh, Netanyahu and Trump were facing. So was to give them a boost. Uh, that is one. Um, secondly, um, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, right now we see a process of reorganizing the Middle East. You know, the empires and the U.S. and others will always talk about the new Middle East. Mm -hmm. And I guess I see this as part of the new Middle East that they are trying to uh, reorganize. Uh, but the third important point, I think, and this is where uh, we need you, mm -hmm. uh, You know, uh, for the last 20 years, we have been fighting Christian Zionism. Mm -hmm. Now... Uh, the Christian Zionists are actually creating Islamic Zionists mm -hmm. <laughs> using some religious figures in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf region, you know, to say, you know, why bother? I mean, it's written in the Quran that, you know, uh, this land belongs to the Jewish people and so we have to have peace, etc. And, and it's interesting that uh, actually some of the most Zionist Christian groups in the States in the last two years were visiting mainly Saudi Arabia and the Gulf mm -hmm. and were actually uh, welcomed by all of these sheikhs. Uh, uh, and so you could see that that connection uh, being, uh, being fought. For me, this is an imperial, another imperial project. Uh, this time utilizing Islam as a tool for normalization. Well, that's precisely one of the points that I wanted to raise later on because we are experiencing not only in the Muslim world, but also here in the United States, the recruitment of Muslim figures. Uh, we have a program that's run by the Shalom Hartman Institute. It's called Muslim yeah. Leadership Initiative uh, that takes, uh, especially uh, Muslim figures outside of the Arab Palestinian community in particular uh, on these fully paid trips and a whole year engagement uh, to see Israel through uh, uh, American Zionist Jewish eyes and then begin to have a discourse to blame the Palestinian and you. So we're having this experience here in the United States and we're also having the experience in the Muslim world, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, the pr process of normalization. It is to silence the Palestinians, one, but also to have the uh, almost the blaming the victim for the fact mm -hmm. that they are being victimized. So I think you're accurate to, to say that this is one of the new ter territories. Maybe there was something under the table being done before in terms of right. these coordination, but now it's out in the public uh, and it's being recruited in various parts. Right. Um, and, and I think this is why we need to together to work on, uh, you know, dismantling this, uh, this narrative and exposing it to what it really is. Yeah. Uh, let me maybe uh, get into the question of the Kairos document and to really highlight uh, the particular parts of it, because it's again, it's uh, the 13 different uh, Palestinian uh, churches and leadership that put out this document. Uh, and I think it's very important for us to, to build on uh, the significance of it and to highlight what are the really key features of it that people need to be aware and how to mobilize it. I know the Presbyterians have written almost a study guide of how to take the uh, Kairos document. And I think it's a very important piece to both study, and I'm speaking to my Muslim brothers and sisters who are listening, but also those outside of the Muslim community, that this is an important piece uh, of uh, contribution to the struggle for Palestine. So uh, just give us a almost a history of it, but also how to mobilize it in an effective way for us. Yeah, yeah, thank you. You know, uh, I mean, uh, this document started really as, as a process uh, like 2007, uh, because at that time we felt, uh, you know, there was no movement on the Palestinian question. Uh, we felt that we tried negotiation, it didn't work. Uh, we tried, uh, you know, uh, armed resistance, it didn't work. And we were really searching like for a third uh, uh, road, if you want, a third option. And we felt as a Christians, we have to tell our 
uh, to say a, a word about it. Uh, especially that we felt at that time the world was slowly neglecting uh, our story uh, and uh, our oppression. Uh, people were moving into other issues. Um, and so uh, a group of Christian leaders came together uh, uh, from different denominations. And this is the first time that we had people all the way, like from the Greek Orthodox uh, to the Baptist, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with Lutheran, Anglicans, Roman Catholic, Greek Catholics, Armenian. I mean, everyone came together. Uh, and uh, we wanted really to tell our story uh, in a, uh, and to address it to our people, to the Christians in Palestine in the first place, but to the Christian of the world in, in a second. Uh, and the outcome was this document that we called Kairos, as I said, because we wanted to connect with the South African uh, experience. Uh, and if you look at the document, it talks about faith, uh, hope and love. Faith really tries to deal with the issue how to understand the Bible from a Palestinian perspective. And here we were really uh, trying to fight Christian Zionism uh, and saying that uh, you cannot really read the Bible through a Christian Zionist eye. This is not the Bible. It becomes something different. In terms of hope, we were struggling with the issue how to hope at times of despair. I mean, when, when everything, even right now, you feel everything is against you. You feel mm -hmm. sometimes that, the, I mean, you are fighting an empire, you know? And so how can you have hope when you are fighting the empire and the empire have all the, all the tools, mm -hmm. you know, economic, political, uh, uh, ideological, etc. cetera. Uh, and there, uh, we developed really the, the, the idea, uh, if I put it now in my words, hope is not what we see, but hope is what we do. So it was really a call for action. Hope is a call for action, not a call to wait, because as Palestinians often, we were waiting, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a, a church member, uh, he died uh, some time ago. You know, every time two political leaders say, uh, uh, King Hussein and somebody else were meeting. He was always hoping that after the meeting, the Palestinian, uh, you know, uh, oppression will be over. They will find the solution. <laughs> and actually he died, he became maybe 80 years old, while waiting. Mm -hmm. And we are saying wait, waiting doesn't help. It's call to action. And the third was love. Uh, and love, we were struggling with the issue, uh, how to love the enemy as a human, and yet to resist mm. uh, the systemic oppression that he develops or she develops. Uh, and so that our struggle is not against individuals, mm. but it's against systemic oppression. And I guess this is now the topic in the US. When I look at the African-American, uh, uh, you know, uh, and what's happening in the street, it's really about systemic oppression. This is our problem. Uh, you know, our problem is not with this individual white person or that white person. It's with the system. It's a systematic oppression. So that's what really we're focusing uh, on. I have to say that uh, this uh, document was important, first of all, to mobilize our own people. Mm. Uh, because sometimes if you live in Palestine, sometimes it's easy to lose uh, hope or heart. And so mobilizing our people was our first uh, aim. But secondly, mobilizing the Christian community worldwide. And I have to say within the last 11 years, uh, there are today uh, Kairos groups in almost 30 countries. Uh, and just recently, we actually launched uh, as, as a global Kairos, uh, we launched uh, the Cry for Hope, uh, uh, which I think is really another uh, important uh, feature there um, and it's it's uh, the subtitle is a call for decisive action mm -hmm. uh, and this is really what what we are aiming at because you know uh, too many words were were said about the Palestinian issue uh, uh, you know we had negotiations unendlessly but without action 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and what we really need is a decisive action. So as you mentioned, uh, faith, hope, and love, uh, maybe for our audience, if you have your wish, what type of projects uh, you would recommend for people to engage, uh, projects that you're engaged in, and you, you mentioned the project in Gaza is very important, uh, project at the University Dar el Kalima, uh, mention some of those uh, uh, projects and programs, maybe also Palestine as well as outside of Palestine. I know some of our audience are engaged in all types of uh, social justice movements, some churches, some uh, uh, Muslim uh, organizations, student organizations. Uh, what are those programs that people can actually uh, latch on and begin to do some work? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, maybe uh, let me start first. Uh, uh, what can people like in the US uh, maybe do? Um, and I think uh, awareness is important, uh, you know, uh, because there are different, uh, you know, uh, like, I mean, awareness is an ongoing thing. And I think working on the narrative awareness is important because all the time, you know, Christian Zionists, uh, the Israel lobby, uh, the Christian, uh, the, the religious right or the political right, they are trying to, to, to talk, to take us to a terrain that is really totally, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's a tactic just to avoid the real questions. Mm-hmm. So you don't talk anymore about what's happening in Palestine, the real issues, uh, the real suffering, the, the annexation, uh, the colonization, etc. But you start talking about uh, you know, replacement theology or about, uh, you know, the violence of the Palestinian. Uh, um, and you, you start talking about, uh, you know, uh, the persecuted Christians or whatever. And we need to keep making people aware on the, the real issue. Mm-hmm. So that is important. And this is why I think I'm personally, you know, so involved in writing because I feel awareness is important. Uh, but also social media, etc. So I think that's 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 important. Uh, second and and secondly, uh, I I uh, really hope that, that uh, many churches and groups can come together, maybe to read the book, to study it, uh, but also to connect to Palestine. Uh, I mean, what you are doing today is an excellent example. Is you know using Zoom to invite people from Palestine. Uh, to connect, that's very, very important. We need more uh, like, like what you are doing, Hatim. Great, great, uh, great work. Uh, so that is one piece. But what action can we take in the, in the US? And there are lots of actions uh, that can be uh, done uh, in the States from, you know, uh, you know from uh, using boycott to, uh, uh, to supporting uh, uh, students in Palestine, uh, to creating uh, bridges between the U.S. and Palestine, uh, exchange programs. Uh, this is really very, very important. Um, and uh, for us, I guess, uh, as a, a university of arts and culture, uh, we want to utilize the medium of art Mm -hmm. Uh, not only to tell our story, but also to spread. Because, you know, not everyone is interested in a political lecture. Mm -hmm. Uh, And often when we do political lectures, from my experience in the States, uh, you you know, you get the 60 people, and 40 of them are, they know everything. Uh, They are there, you know, to support you. Uh, And 10 uh, people are there by accident, they don't know how how they ended up there. Mm -hmm. And 10 people are there maybe to make some problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh, what we are trying to do now, we have, for example, uh, because our students are are producing films uh, uh, to to use uh, film festivals, Mm -hmm. Uh, San Francisco Film Festival, for example, uh, uh, screen some of our films. Uh, One of our students got the third award at Cannes Film Festival. Uh, it was the first time that a Palestinian student, uh, you know, gets uh, uh, something at Cannes. And so, uh, you know, we offer as a university for 
groups and churches, uh, many, many films that our students have produced, and they talk about life in Palestine. Uh, the hopes and the fears, uh, both of them are, are articulated in this. And many of the films, you know, got excellent awards, international awards as well. So, so that is one. All right, right now we have in the States a uh, three art exhibition touring. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, photography exhibition, but also art exhibition. Again, a, a different way of telling our story and connecting uh, with the cultural community, because you know this this art community is important in changing perception. Uh, many things that change throughout the year in the U.S. they change through the art community. Actually, it's the art community who create often social change, and so this is what we want to utilize. Uh, we had uh, festivals in the States that we were doing, uh, bringing students, uh, etc. Uh, but also now since uh, online education is, is, uh, uh, is progressing, uh, we, we would like to see more uh, specialized professors in the arts, see in the States, give courses online to our students in Palestine. Uh, you know, uh, developing uh, a partnership between universities here and our university. Um, but also special attention we would like to give to Gaza mm -hmm. uh, because the situation there is unbearable. Uh, but, but, but you have there, you know, uh, so many young people who are so gifted. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, they are just waiting for somebody really to develop that skills so that they can tell their story. So these are just, you know, uh, some ideas. Yeah. I'm completely with you on the importance of art, culture, and cultural production, and maybe building on uh, Edward Said's uh, work on Orientalism, his work in relations to latent Orientalism, which are really the uh, area of culture, uh, production, the art, the cinema, the movies that actually creates the stereotypical images that then inform policy. Uh, exactly. So as we begin to think of the different ways, uh, both of uh, narrating Palestine through the arts, through the music, through the culture, uh, increasingly we're actually having to narrate Palestine through food. One area that we're, these days we're, uh, confronting in the United States is the uh, stealing and transformation of Palestinian food. Now, I have a vested interest, so every time they say Israeli kunafa, you know, as a Nabilsi, that's just like, I'll, I'll, I go into a crisis. But you have the That's your territory, so yeah. It's, it's my territory, so it's not only in terms of uh, art, but food, uh, dress, right. and the uh, modes of really transforming uh, Palestine by colonizing every symbolic representation of it. Exactly, and this is really, you know, part of settler colonialism because settler colonialism, they don't want to replace you physically only, but they want to replace you in every aspect of your life. So mm. occupy your food, your culinary, etc. Uh, yeah, that's, that's really, that's it. And so, you know, we have published several also culinary art book uh, books as university. We did one and just recently now a new book is coming out with several personalities from Palestine called Craving Palestine. Yeah. So whenever you have a tasting, just invite me. So just to, <laughs> to be able to look at it. <laughs> but not for Kinafa because... <laughs> because I'll, I'll have to invite you. you. <laughs> I'll have to invite you for that. But really, uh, maybe we could ask a, little, a couple of questions or maybe one question is about the PDS movement and how the PDS movement uh, actually uh, can be integrated or is integrated into the work that you do, especially as we're seeing some success in different places, whether it's in Ireland, Italy, even success in, on the college campuses in the United States and boycott, uh, divestment and sanctions, especially in the cultural academic boycott, which has been a very uh, critical piece of the discussion. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, regarding the cultural boycott, uh, uh, this is something that uh, we signed on from day one. Uh, and for us, that is very important. But as Kairos Palestine, actually, we were really uh, attacked mainly because Kairos Palestine uh, mentions uh, uh, 
uh, PDS. Mm -hmm. uh, because we are saying it's under love, actually, it comes under love. Because if we want to find um, uh, alternatives to armed resistance, uh, I mean, what, what, what tools do you have? Uh, if you exclude PDS, you are left with not really much. Uh, and so, and so Kairos uh, document uh, actually mentioned that, uh, and this is why, uh, you know, Kairos document was attacked so much, uh, uh, you know, by Zionist groups and, and so on. Uh, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, another, uh, uh, another it's, it's, it's linked to that. Uh, why is culture important? Because it has to do with, with, with your own identity. Mm. Uh, and, and, and developing a, 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 a dynamic identity uh, is really important. And, and for me, this is our biggest fight, uh, is how to not only to preserve our identity, because preserving is the wrong thing, but how to keep developing it uh, so that it's not crushed, because at the end of the day, occupation wants to crush your identity. And so how can we resist that? And for me, uh, arts and culture are the tools to do exactly that. And maybe for some of our audience that are listening, if you have an academic program, if you happen to be uh, in charge of uh, a department or teaching in one place or the other, uh, these are the areas where you could actually proactively. So there is the BDS of speaking about why we need to boycott, divest, and sanction, but also to create links with the Palestinians. So uh, send your students to study in Palestine, to visit, to engage as a way of also uh, bringing the culture, the society, the narrative of Palestinians into, into direct engagement. Uh, and uh, Hatim, for those who are interested in, in these kinds of activities, they can contact, uh, you know, our support organization, Bright Stars of Bethlehem, yes. that really helps facilitate uh, these kinds of exchanges and visits, uh, etc. So it's Bright Stars of Bethlehem. Uh, you, you, if they look it up, brightstarsbethlehem.org is the website. Yeah, but for those in the Bay Area, we have a uh, we have a chapter in here that usually chapter. does a lot of uh, activities, yeah. and they actually have a Christmas uh, uh, gatherings for people to buy products from Palestine as gifts. So I'll make sure that we will uh, provide that co contact information for people to actually link up uh, with the work. We have a number of questions in the Q and A. So can you yes. access the Q and A if you're going to take a look? There's a cluster of questions about relationship and, and uh, solidarity in comparisons to the struggle uh, with uh, uh, the Black Lives Matters or the minorities in the United States. How do you uh, navigate that or how, what would be your perspective on it? Uh, sorry, I missed that. I was reading the questions. <laughs> so can well, you repeat the question? May, there's a few questions on that cluster of really looking at the uh, a struggle in the United States uh, and how the struggle in the United States relative to what we see in terms of violence that's directed at the uh, black community and what can we navigate the solidarity between Palestinians and the black community and I know there is a discussion taking place almost in the next hour specifically dealing with Palestinian black solidarity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, this solidarity for me is very important. Uh, uh, and we need to, you know, we need to invest more and more uh, in this. Because if you look at it, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the story is so similar. Uh, it starts actually with demonizing both Palestinians and uh, black people. Uh, through the Bible, through misusing the Bible, mm. uh, as children of Ham. Mm. So the theological so location like, of racism. Exactly. Yeah. So it starts there, and both of us are there in the same, uh, in the same chapter. You know. Mm. Uh, so it starts there, and then you feel how you know uh, uh, colonialism. Uh, uh, was really uh, the trigger that that took 
everything we had uh, and tried to enslave us. Uh, for the African American community, I think their situation is even, I mean, their oppression is much longer than ours. Uh, unfortunately, we always talk about the Holocaust, but we never talk about the plight of the African American. We, do, we don't talk about the plight of the Native American uh, because that is, I mean, th the world didn't really uh, do anything to compensate for what they have been uh, going through. Uh, but also, if you look at how the neighborhoods uh, of the African American were, were conceived mm -hmm. uh, and how they were put in those places that were not the prime land, uh, but really uh, the, the places with less resources, you can see the assembly between what's happening in the West Bank today you know, and the Trump plan actually, and what's happening to the African American community. It's interesting um, you mentioned that because uh, today is the anniversary of the March on Washington by MLK. Right. Uh, but MLK in his later years, especially 67 and 68, in his speech, The Three Evils of Society, right. Militarism, Materialism, and Racism, he spoke of the condition of the black person in relation to the internal colonial. So he actually looked at the conditions of the uh, black community from the lens of experiencing internal colonization. Uh, and in here, the similarity in terms of looking at how the structure uh, within uh, you know, inner city communities really follows the same type of uh, uh, topography of settler colonialism and colonialism in general. Exactly. And I think, you know, uh, settler colonialism is really uh, another important factor that brings us together because when you, when you talk about secular colonialism, there are two other important features of settler colonialism. It's not only taking the land, replacing the people, etc. But one which is really important is demonizing mm. the indigenous. So the indigenous or the blacks in this case are the violent, mm -hmm. are the terrorists. But the state terrorism Nobody talks about it. So you demonize them, and through that, uh, you know, uh, you, 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 you get the right to oppress them more. And the other uh, important aspect of settler colonialism is a policing state. Mm. Uh, because, uh, you know, to, to keep that oppression, the, the settler colonial, they have to develop a policing state. And this is unfortunately what you see happening in Israel. And unfortunately now many, many police stations in the US were asking Israeli police officer to come and teach them. And so uh, I think this is part, you know, that's part of the other connection that is happening there. Yeah, we have uh, the ADL and the AJC and some of the major Zionist organization promote the training program for local police to go to train on uh, violence and how to counter violence in Israel. So it becomes the go-to place, not only in terms of police, but also the whole notion of the war on terrorism, uh, that Israel becomes the go-to experts uh, on that field. Right. Uh, and, you know, I mean, if you think of George Floyd and one day later, uh, Halak mm -hmm. in Jerusalem, I mean, very similar story uh, that is happening on a daily basis. Where, where the life of the individual Palestinian or African-American is almost worthless. You know, uh, if, if one Israeli is killed, you know, that will be in the news everywhere. Mm. But now you need maybe 20 Palestinians to be killed to get uh, notice of it. So that is part of, of that, uh, of that uh, ideology. Uh, I would like to thank Ruth Nelson. She gave, put us the link for brightstarsofbethlehem.org. So it's in available in the Q&A. So make sure to access it. Gregory asked the question, could we hear more about Islamic Zionism in light of the Israeli-UAE agreement? So if you want to expand on the, the emergence and the development and really what take place. Increasingly, we're going to see some uh, tours that are coming to use the visitation to Al-Aqsa Mosque as a form of normalization. Exactly, yeah. You know, I, actually I wrote about uh, Islamic Zionism, like I started talking about it like two or three years ago, 
and people were attacking me. They thought this is just not the time to talk about it. It's, it's, uh, it's not important, etc. I remember uh, last year I was in Brazil mm. uh, uh, and I met with ambassadors of the Gulf region and, uh, and Saudi Arabia and so on. Uh, and they asked me to speak and they wanted me to speak about Christian Zionism, which I did. But then towards the end, I mentioned <laughs> Islamic Zionism and normalization. And then <laughs> they were like, uh, you know, speechless. But, uh, but the thing is, you know, uh, religion, if you look at religion in the Middle East right now, religion is used in two ways. Mm. I mean, religion is used in the US. Yes. I will not talk about that uh, because you, you live it day in and day out. And, uh, but, but if you look at the Middle East, religion is used in two ways. One, by those in power to give them legitimacy. Mm. So you have to be related to the prophet to give you legitimacy to rule. Uh, you have to be the defender of Islam to give you legitimately to rule. So that's one way. Mm -hmm. The other way is that the opposition utilizes religion to come to power. Mm. And so that is the dilemma we are, we feel in. And so if we look at the Gulf region right now, etc. Uh, uh, when, whenever the Gulf, uh, uh, you know, leaders want to move towards normalization, they need religious legitimacy to do that. Mm -hmm. So what they do is, you know, they create the, these sheikhs that suddenly come up with a Quranic verse and try to build around it, you know, uh, the legitimacy why to normalize relations with Israel, as if this were a religious problem, which is not a religious problem. I mean, our problem is not a religious problem. Our problem actually is a problem of colonialism, systemic uh, racism, uh, uh, oppression. That's our problem. Now, so, so they, they uh, all of these sheikhs, they, they, and you can see them on, 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 on social media, they start developing these uh, uh, Quranic teachings. But in general, actually, the if they lean toward peace, right, you lean toward peace, but they don't tell you it's they're leaning toward taking a piece of your land, but that's a separate <laughs> issue. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly, exactly. So, yeah. so that's, that's what, what we are talking about. And I guess this will accelerate uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, months and years. And so we have to be uh, you know, we have to be really uh, aware of it. And there, Hatton, we need you because I cannot that do that fight. I fight Christian Zionism. You have to deal with. I will. Islamic I'll promise Zionism. you that I will be giving you a piece <laughs> soon on that subject because it's something that we've been following. We've been following and doing the work on the MLI uh, in the United States and their their work in there, challenging also some of these new modes of cooperation under the rubric uh, that they're fighting uh, Islamophobia. For example, a relationship that's been struck by AJC, the American Jewish Committee, that also travels to the Gulf to advise them on all types of issues, but they've been one of the primary uh, uh, organization that mainstreamed anti-Muslim discourse. So on the one hand, they slab you. On the other hand, they actually are offering themselves as the go-to and inviting a number of Muslim personalities uh, into that space. So the, there is a systematic work uh, that's being done to actually uh, put an Islamic uh, umbrella over settler colonialism with Israel for a whole notion of modernity, development, business deals, which creates you know, the Arab world becoming the conduit uh, for it. And then uh, despotic rule, ruling or despotic uh, governments that this is becomes for it the way to have access to the United States. Uh, the road to Washington DC passes through Tel Aviv. So before you come to uh, the United States, right. you basically develop those relations and it's good to have a religious figure that basically give you a Quranic statement or a hadith and long and behold, you embrace settler colonialism. So I think uh, you're accurate that we need some heavy work on, on this in the days and months uh, ahead. 
Right, and I think, I think it's very important to work together uh, and to involve even Jewish groups like Jewish Voices for Peace and others who are fighting their own fight also uh, with, with that. So yeah, that's important. Uh, maybe the last uh, question, another question says from Herb, uh, he said, have you experienced yourself Islamic Zionism in Palestine? Um, no, in Palestine, actually, I, 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 I didn't experience that. Uh, it's very difficult, uh, I think, to be Palestinian Muslim and to be Zionist. Uh, although I, I wouldn't be totally surprised if a few people like that will emerge. Uh, because I know within uh, the Christian Palestinian community, we have, we have some of those people uh, that emerged uh, uh, in the last few years, uh, especially in Galilee and others, because again, you know, you have uh, churches from Texas, for example, investing heavily uh, in Nazareth, mm. you know, uh, creating their seminary to, to train people with this kind of Christian Zionism. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that develop sometimes in Palestine because again there is this huge imperial machinery mm -hmm. uh, that that wants to produce these kinds of people uh, one of the last questions is actually touches on your uh, uh, speaking about the cultural production and uh, Palestinians says there's there is not enough cultural reporting in the region at the moment as a graduate student journalist an aspiring foreign correspondent, what are some sources I can use uh, to begin bringing more attention to cultural, music, artistic, and religious movement like Kairos in Palestine? How can I combat the systematic colonization that allows for the Western religious system uh, that are accelerating this process? So maybe yeah. some guidance. Yeah, I mean, actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, for example, uh, 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 our friend, he can maybe start with one of the books uh, that we published. Uh, my colleague at the university, Fatin Mitwasi, uh, published a book about Palestinian art that gives like an overview of, of the development of Palestinian art in the last uh, 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 50 years. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, another thing is, I mean, today, uh, I mean, if we look at the film, I mean, Palestinian films are, are, are making it all the way to, uh, you know, the most prestigious, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, awards. Uh, in fact, right now, one of the Palestinian films is running uh, uh, for such an award. And so, I mean, there is, I mean, today it's not like 10 years or 20 years ago. The Palestinian art is, is becoming uh, really more and more visible. Uh, and uh, if, I mean, just contact us and I can put you in contact with people who can really help you there uh, a bit uh, more with very concrete uh, ideas. But Palestine is, is I mean, uh, culture is, is, is so lively, is, is, is developing in a way that I'm personally, I see this very important transformation happening right now. Uh, in music, in, in, in film, in, in visual art, uh, but also in other fields. Yeah. I know locally here in the Bay Area, we have uh, Aswat, which is actually is having an online Palestinian concert. And I will share that as well, uh, uh, that they try as much as possible to bring the culture and uh, music and so on into the uh, spaces that otherwise would not have that representation. So I think that's very important. Uh, th there are maybe two other, just uh, quickly, yes. you know, we, we uh, uh, or three, we, as, as university, uh, we launched uh, um, a, a competition uh, in painting. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it Ismail Shamut Award. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ismail Shamut was one of the most famous, maybe, Palestinian uh, artists. Uh, and so if, if people look that on Facebook, they will see, actually, right now, uh, the, the next competition is taking place, and we will announce it in a month's time. Uh, we created an award in photography uh, 
under the name of Karima Aboud. Karima Aboud was the first female photographer in the whole Arab world. She was born in Bethlehem. Uh, she started uh, her career already in 1920. Uh, I don't think at that time they were even for female photographer mm. in the US. Uh, so if you look up uh, Karima Aboud, you will find this competition. And we started uh, also um, uh, a Bethlehem Student Film Festival, mm. uh, asking students throughout the world to send you know, their films to Palestine. Uh, and uh, this year, we got over 3,300 films from over 70 countries. So this, the student festival is becoming important. And for us, it's important to reach students while they are studying uh, so that they can connect with Palestine. Uh, and so uh, if, if, if we have students in film, please look up uh, this festival and send for the next year, next April, uh, your films. Yeah. One area that, uh, again, if the individuals who ask the question, uh, for me, I had a student that did their uh, honor thesis on reading the walls, uh, especially the art that's on the wall and the uh, uh, cartoons, the writing is also documenting the various periods. Uh, for example, as the George Floyd's uh, uh, murder took place, you had a mural that came out on the wall when the Pope visited uh, Bethlehem in Palestine, you also had a whole uh, right. art that is there. So this is a way for actually reading Palestinian, narrating Palestinian history through both challenging the world, but also transforming how we see the world without actually looking at also Bansky's work that uh, right. is so critical. Uh, Hatem, uh, 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 one important thing actually, uh, we are proud that as university, we were the first group to paint on the wall, yeah. uh, 2003. And what we did, we, we invited three of the top Mexican uh, muralists mm -hmm. uh, who were painting on the wall in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, that was still very small, etc. We invited them to Palestine. They spent two weeks with us, 2003. And they did uh, like over 10, huge murals and this is how the whole process actually started so we were there uh, at the beginning and we wrote about it uh, uh, we wrote uh, the whole story is documented with those pictures yeah maybe at one point i'll design a course uh, reading the wall narrating palestine and really going through that so maybe we could work on this on the future uh, as well uh, with pleasure with pleasure, pleasure. So maybe just a last question, uh, what gives you hope and uh, what's next in uh, your work? Yeah, uh, you know, what gives me hope is uh, looking at our students and seeing the transformation that is happening there. Uh, you know, often they come uh, thinking it's over, we cannot do much. Uh, you know, and, and suddenly uh, through the four years, I see how they, you know, they find hope, they find a language, uh, they find a way to tell their story. Uh, and, uh, and the resilience of our people is really what gives me hope. And this is why, you know, uh, I say, you know, this whole settler colonialism, they were thinking they can replace us easily. Today, there are 6.5 million Palestinians uh, in historic Palestine that are resilient and they learn the lesson from the Nakba, they are not going to go away. Uh, and the other thing is we have 6.5 million Palestinians in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. uh, and Hatim, you are the best example for that. I mean, whenever I meet you know, these Palestinians in the diaspora today, they are much different than 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. 30 years ago, they were very, very cautious. They didn't want to engage in politics. Today, if I look at, and I said that just in my lecture at Chautauqua three days ago, if I see, for example, uh, all the groups for Palestinians, uh, uh, for uh, students for justice in Palestine at the universities in the US. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm so proud because this is often the second, third, fourth generation of students, you know, uh, 
who are just not giving up. They are very well educated. They are articulate. You know, my daughter happened to, to chair one of those groups uh, in St. Olaf uh, a few years ago. So, mm-hmm. you know, I feel proud and this gives me hope that, you know, okay, our struggle is long because we are fighting an empire. But at the end of the day, you know, and this is the lesson I learned being a theologian. You know, if you look at our history in Palestine, we have all of these empires. They came, none of them was able to stay forever. Mm. Sometimes it took up to 400 years, the longest. But at the end of the day, you know, the local people uh, uh, were able to to stay. Uh, And this is why uh, in one of my books, I talk about uh, the saying of Jesus, uh, blessed are the meek, they will inhabit the land. Mm. Because often we think this is nonsense because it's the empire, it's the settlers who inherit the land. But Jesus looked at history long durée and mm-hmm. he saw all the empires, they come, they cannot stay. But it's the meek, it's those people who are really not, not the empire, who are the weak. But they, they because of their resilience, they, they stay. So what is next? Uh, uh, as I said, uh, I, you know, uh, this, my next book, The Politics of, uh, of Persecution, mm. uh, uh, Middle Eastern Christianity in the Age of Empire, uh, is uh, hopefully will come out in nine months. Um, I'm working on, on now a few other uh, a new book about Karima Abboud. We wrote mm. that in Arabic, but now we are writing a book in English uh, because we want to, to celebrate, you know, these Palestinian icons mm-hmm. uh, that nobody maybe knew about them. Uh, but oh, because this, is, this gives us hope, you know. Uh, it, it gives us also an insight into Palestine before the Nakba. True. Uh, True. You know, uh, where we are as people and, and, and so on. Uh, so this is in terms of writing. Um, in terms of uh, uh, right now, we are working to develop to transform the college to become a full-fledged university uh, uh, on arts and culture. So we are working heavily today. Actually, we had a strategic plan with all of our staff on that. So this will will keep us busy for the next uh, 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 two years. And by all means, you have us as a community of support, anything that you would like for us to contribute in any way, time, effort, and so on to your effort, uh, call on us, we're there. And also you have an extended invitation. As soon as the book comes out, uh, you have to come to Berkeley uh, for a lecture or we'll organize it jointly with the Graduate Theological Union. As you know, you're a frequent guest, so the invitation is there, and look forward to really picking your book and promote it as well. Uh, it's a very, very critical piece uh, for me, the voice of uh, Palestinian Christians uh, to come out, but also Palestinians in general. That's part of the constructing the mosaic narrative uh, that continues exactly. to be absent. Uh, exactly. Really, uh, thank you, Mitri, for this enriching conversation. Uh, uh, this. Uh, open new vestas for us to engage. I think the conversation about Christian Zionism, uh, conversations about Kairos, Palestine, but more critically, the push toward uh, writing about Islamic Zionism. I know that I have an assignment now. Uh, so thank you <laughs> very much for that. And uh, wish you and your family and everyone in Palestine the best. Take care of yourself. Uh, take care of the community that you uh, uh, minister to during the COVID-19. You're, all of you are in our prayers and thoughts at this point as the challenges are multiple, but I trust that uh, we will persevere. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Hatem. Uh, you know, uh, we are so proud of what you are doing. Uh, keep the good work that you are doing. Uh, and I know we have so many projects to work on together in the future. I look forward to that. Absolutely. It's always really... Uh, exciting and enriching to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Wish you all the best. Salam. 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 Thank you. Thanks.